Yeah. My sister also is here for the first time. Uh, yes. Her name is Anusha. Yeah. 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 Special guest group comes, the class will be continued based on the books, and then also at the end there's the question and answers. And then what that is the Arati at 1 o'clock, 1 15, we'll serve out Prashadam uh, right before the announcements. So, without any further delay, please ask one more time, Prabhu, move forward. If you see the place in front of you, that means you can move forward. Let others sit behind us. For mothers, can you speak a little bit if you can? Uh, there's one more here. Setting up, Prabhu is famous for going the Madhu Purushan prayers. I'm not sure if he sing today, but to be there.
Mam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashthaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tinam Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pacharine Nibi Se Sasanyavari Paschati Pacharine Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nathananda Sri Advaita Gudadhara Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama Is today's class about how to be enthusiastic? It can be. <laughs> Was that the title? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, I missed the name of the class. How to be enthusiastic in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> That's easy. Just take more prasadam. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> what kind of a prasadam? Chatur Masya rules. One of the most interesting things about one of the most interesting things about this topic is Prabhupada is has asked us to be enthusiastic, but he never told us how. He just said, be. He said, be enthusiastic. But there was not like 10 steps to enthusiasm. Of course, we understand that if you follow spiritual practices, you'll be enthusiastic, but the general instruction was to be enthusiastic. It's like, okay, so we naturally think, well, how do you do that? And so sometimes Prabhupada would, would say, you just do it. Because if you don't do it, then you'll be in trouble. Because if you lose enthusiasm for whatever it is you're doing, whether it's spiritual or material, you're not going to be, you're not going to get far, right? For many years, um, I did the service of distributing Prabhupada's books. And um, if you're not enthusiastic, you can go out all day. <laughs> and you, no one will take a book because... You're not so enthusiastic about what you're doing, nobody's going to be enthusiastic about what you're doing. And many great teachers, philosophers, writers have all said, without enthusiasm you can't achieve anything, and Prabhupada said that also. So I have a story about enthusiasm. To illustrate this point, to illustrate both these points I'm making, you have to be enthusiastic even if you're not, you just be enthusiastic because if you're not, you're not going anywhere. So, this is a long story, I'll try to make it short. We have a temple in Mumbai, uh, in a place called Juhu. And that land was purchased in the early 70s, I don't know when, 1974 or something. And the man who, who sold us the land had sold the land to someone before us and through some legal tactics was able to get the land back from the people he sold it to and also keep the money that they gave as a deposit. So before our spiritual master Sri the Prabhupada came to America, he had actually seen that land and he thought this would be a really nice place for a temple. It was just a fishing village, you know, 45 minutes from downtown Mumbai. So. But anyway, Prabhupada thought it would be a great place and so it finally came up for sale from the same man who tried to cheat, who successfully cheated the person before them, and he tried to do that with us. And so one of the ways he did it, which we didn't know, is the man who was selling the land bribed all the police officials to not give us the permits that we needed because if we didn't get the permits, we couldn't build the temple, and if that happened, we would have to relinquish the land and we would lose the deposit. I guess that was a contract, right? One thing we didn't know, that all our lawyers were actually on his side, not on our side. So whatever our lawyers told us to do was just so we wouldn't get the land. So what was happening, the devotees didn't know that. So every day they would go into town 
to talk to officials. I mean, it's hard enough when the officials are neutral. Well, what to speak if they're not on your side? You know how things can take, thanks to the British bureaucracy that they gave to India, things can be incredibly complicated. Simple things can be complicated. So I guess the devotees just thought it was just ordinary bureaucracy. So they're going, talking to this official. No, no, you need to talk to this official. No, no, you need to get this permit. Then come back with this. And you need to get this guy to sign this. And after he signs this, get this stamped and pay 100 rupees and, get, and bring it to this office. And this is like every day. Like, and at the end of the day, nothing. No permit. They couldn't get it. So did one of the devotees that was whose service it was to try to get the permit, every day he'd go into town and he'd meet the same problem and he'd come back like disgusted, just completely drained, burned out, frustrated. So one evening there was an RT, everyone was chanting and dancing and that devotee was just sitting down with his head down, frustrated. And he's trying every day to get the permit. And in America, it would take 20 minutes, and it's going like three months, and you know, it's not happening, right? And Prabhupada saw him. So after class, Prabhupada was giving a lecture about enthusiasm. And he said, you should be enthusiastic even if you don't get the municipal permit. Because he knew this devotee was completely distraught. He said, you should, you should be enthusiastic. And so, and you might say, I'm not enthusiastic. Like, how can I be enthusiastic? I'm not. And Prabhupada's saying, you should be, even if you're not, basically. Um, and sometimes we were told that Prabhupada said, you should dance in the kirtan, even if you don't feel like it. Yes. Because if you dance in the kirtan, you will feel like it. <laughs> right? Yes? There's a beautiful story that takes place in New York in the beginning of the movement. In Western religions, people do not bow down. In, in Catholic religion, they go on their knees and put their head down. But, they, but in the Jewish religion, most Christian religions, they don't bow down. So for a Jewish New Yorker, a Jewish New Yorker from a wealthy family coming to the Hare Krishna temple and being interested and seeing people bow down, it was just like didn't work for them. It's like, I, I, don't, bow, I don't do this bowing down stuff. You know? That's like not, it's not what we do, you know. So, one devotee, his brother, he's also Jewish, his brother said, I don't bow down to nobody. <laughs> yeah, that's like, you know, yeah. Except birth, old age, disease and death, and your wife, yeah. Nobody else, right? <laughs> and the mighty doll, you bow down to that also, right? <laughs> so anyway, this devotee, you know, he, he was a devotee and he was attached to Prabhupada, but he was very young in Krishna consciousness. And he said, Prabhupada, I don't want to bow down because I don't feel it. You know, it wasn't like he, he didn't think bowing down was a good idea. He didn't think it was bad. He just didn't feel it because it was so foreign. And he said, if I bow down and I don't feel it, then it's artificial. And so you, know, you don't want to be artificial, right? You want to be real. <laughs> Get real, Prabhu. <laughs> yeah. How come you don't chant your rounds? I don't want to be artificial. <laughs> I want to be real. How come you don't follow any of the principles? Because I want to be real. Man. I'm sick of this, like, artificial. <laughs> So it's kind of like that, that mentality, you know. You have to be real. It's about devotion, you know. If you do it falsely, it's like telling someone you love them and you don't, just, you know, to get something from them. So Prabhupada said, he said, no, it doesn't work that way. He said, first you bow down, and by bowing down, you will feel like bowing down. He said, you do the action. This is quite, it's a very interesting philosophy. Because generally, we don't do things we don't feel like doing. We wait till we feel like doing it, which sometimes is never. Like, when will you feel like doing your homework? I'll do it tonight. <laughs> yeah, right. You're never going to feel like it. 
right? And your mother says, no dinner till your homework's done. Then you get it done. <laughs> right? Yeah? He's been there. He's been there. Yeah. That's like daily affair for him, I guess. Okay. So, um, so I teach a course in forgiveness, and I realize the same thing, that, you know, people say, you know, it's difficult to forgive. I don't feel like forgiving. It's like, yeah, that, yeah I understand. But you have to practice acts of forgiveness when you don't feel like it, because then you'll feel like it. And so we did this one exercise. It's a beautiful exercise. So everybody's trying to forgive someone in the workshop. And sometimes you're trying to forgive somebody, and the only experience with this person is just bad. They just did bad things to you. You have like nothing. You never think positive about a person who's only doing bad things. So in this exercise, you had to think positive. You had to say positive things about this person. And some people are saying, there's nothing positive about them. I can't do this exercise. We lock all the doors because everyone would run out. Um, you know, people are like frustrated. I can't do this. There's nothing good. I said, there must be something good about him. You know, even, you know, Osama bin Laden's mother loved him. You know, someone must see good in him. His, his family, his friends, they must see good in him. There must be something good. He has a very nice speaking voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's good in everyone. Um, so after we did the exercise, I asked the devotees, so what happened? How do you feel? Because it was an exercise, basically an exercise of forced appreciation. Like, I don't appreciate this person. I'm going to force you to appreciate. You have to say something nice about them. Otherwise, we're going to sit here and wait for you to say it before we go to the next exercise. <laughs> so, so I said, so what happened? And people said, my heart changed when I said good things about that person. I felt differently, even though I was forced. The action changed the consciousness. Do you know, if you hear criticism of someone, you'll, you'll start to dislike that person, even if you don't know them. Oh, so-and-so is coming. Who's so-and-so? Oh, they're really bad. They, you know, they, they steal money out of parking meters. and you know, like, They just do horrible things. And when they walk in, they're like, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to you. And you can probably, I just made that up. He's a nice person. You know? So when you hear criticism of someone, you, you start feeling resentful, negative, even hateful, spiteful. So this was a practice. And so I, I coined a term, the path to forgiveness is paved with the practice of forgiveness. And then I realized you can change forgiveness to anything. The practice of blank, the, the, the path to blank is paved with the practice of blank. Whatever it is, humility, compassion, kindness, tolerance. The, the path to tolerance is paved with the practice. By practicing, your heart changes. Isn't that interesting? So most of us think, well, I'll be tolerant when I'm tolerant. Like, good luck, you know. I'll, I'll be this when, when my mind you know, gets it and I, I feel like doing it and I feel the humility. So it, it, it has to be the same with enthusiasm because we don't, we're not always enthusiastic about what we should be enthusiastic about. But we have to be enthusiastic about what we should be enthusiastic. So therefore, in our scriptures, it says, be enthusiastic, and no explanation of how. <laughs> it says, you should be this way, be enthusiastic, be patient, right? Utsahan, nishjaya, daya, be, have patience and faith, and like, like how, how do I do that? No, no you, need, you need to have it, figure it out, you know? Mm. So I once, um, once heard a lecture by a very popular what do they call it, inspirational speaker, self-development speaker. And he was saying something similar, like if, you're, if you fake the enthusiasm, it fakes your mind out, and you, you're, you're like your neurons change, or like things change. So I was one day doing something, which I basically on my list of things that I like to do, it was number 12 million and 14, you know, it was like way on the bottom, way on the bottom, like, you know. 
I'd rather go to the dentist, get my tooth pulled, than do this, you know. And so I was getting my, in my car to do that. I had to leave, go away for a weekend. I didn't want to go away. And when I got in my car, I said, yes, we're going away. Yes. I was, I was just doing what he said to do. And, it put, and I, I got excited about it. <laughs> so um, I just want to report to you, it works. What he said, what he said is true. Uh, and if, if there's something you need to be enthusiastic about, sometimes you just have to tell yourself, yes, we're, we're, this, is, this is amazing, yes, we're going to do it. I love this, my favorite activity. We have this affirmation, we have written a book, um, we have this book here if you want to get it. We have a book that's called Job Affirmations. And one of the challenges devotees have when they're chanting japa, because we who are initiated, we chant for two hours a mantra, you know. So you could imagine chanting for two hours might become a little monotonous, you know, just saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over. <laughs> so after a while, it's like, this is hard. Yeah, I'd rather be doing something else. I'd rather be eating ice cream or, you know, on Facebook or Twitter or your favorite uh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, like that. So I wrote an affirmation. The affirmation says, I want to chant, I get to chant, and I love to chant. And some people look at this and, and they look at this affirmation. They're like, what are you talking about? I don't want to chant. I don't like to chant. <laughs> And you're like telling me to say this, like, I'm not going to say this, this is stupid. <laughs> you don't know how many devotees have written me and saying that by saying that affirmation, it totally changed their experience. Right? By force. I said it by force. I love to chant. No, I don't. No, the little voice is going, no, you, do, no, you don't. No, you don't. Say it louder so that you drown that up. I love to chant. Where are my bees? I want to chant more. You know? And you don't stop saying that because that voice will drown you out. And you start chanting and you have a different experience. It's amazing, right? So, when I was here last time or the time before a devotee, what's her name? Nandini? Krishna. 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 Nandini. Or was, wasn't it Govinda? She married, her husband's a Sikh, and they had the Sikh wedding. Oh, oh this is a uh, uh, Gokul, uh, Gokul, uh, Gokul uh, Tarani. Gokul Velasi. Gokul Velasi. Gokul Velasi. Yeah, I, was, I went to their wedding. That was a nice wedding. How long ago was that wedding? 2010. 2010. Oh my God, time flies. So, I don't think it was that time I was here. Maybe it was. Um, at the Sunday feast, she said, like, how do you stay, you ask the question like, how do you stay in Krishna consciousness or how, how do you remain enthusiastic or how like, you're determined? And, um, you know, my, this is my personal realization. If something is true and something is valuable, then you should be enthusiastic about it, even if you're not. Because if you're not, you're going to get diverted from it. So when I learned about Krishna consciousness, my response was, oh my God, I found what I was looking for. This is it. You know, For those first 19 years of wandering around, trying everything under the sun to be happy, that didn't work. So, so then I find it, and then I'm so excited. I'm so excited I drop out of university, <laughs> shave my head and put on a diapers and jump up and down on... <laughs> jump up and down on the street every day. My parents were delighted that I was, they were so happy, you know, that I dropped out of one of the best schools in America. So I'd jump up and down on the street in my diapers. <laughs> but, and I was very enthusiastic, I loved every minute of it, especially the cold showers at 4 a.m. as you're like really, really nice in the winter, you know, and the hardwood floor and you're sleeping back. It was great. It was great. <laughs> so as you're going through this path, you're very enthusiastic in the beginning. I was only 19, very enthusiastic. 
And then you hit a point and you really, you know, it's like you're running, you know, like five miles and you're like, then after like a mile or for me, after like 10, 10 feet, you're like, oh, this is hard. This is harder than I thought. And you start slowing down. So you take the path of, path of bhakti and everything's great and you realize this is harder than I thought because there's more things inside of me that are not Krishna conscious than I realize and they start coming up called attachments, anarthas, you know the envy the, and things like that. You notice them more because you're trying to be pure. When you're not pure you don't really notice them. They kind of just fit right in, kind of like empower you in material life. Yeah. You're envious is good because you'll compete and you'll do better. So you, you don't think it's a bad thing always. So then, you know, you hit this point where it's like, well, this is hard and not so enthusiastic. And my thinking was always, but this is so valuable, it doesn't matter if I'm enthusiastic because it's valuable. I have to be enthusiastic. There's no reason not to be. Like, what am I going to be enthusiastic about? Like, I've already done what I wanted to do and it didn't work for me so why would I be enthusiastic about it right so then it, it sometimes becomes an intellectual process where you just know it's the right thing and maybe you're not feeling it but you're understanding it so you're enthusiastic anyway because you know enthusiasm is going to go somewhere right so if I'm not enthusiastic for devotion I'll be enthusiastic for something else right video games you like video games? Right. You're lucky. When I was a kid, the only video game was like at the bowling alley, some big machine, you know, like six feet long, and all you did was shoot pellets at sitting ducks. Not very exciting. Kind of, you know, shooting ducks is also definitely not exciting anyway, but um, we were fortunate. It's not really something you'd like dream about. You know, I have to go back and play the game. But nowadays it's different, you know, you'll be enthusiastic about something, right? Because there's so many things at your fingertips. So that was my, that was my reasoning. Uh, if it's right, if it's good, we should be enthusiastic. And if we're not enthusiastic, as I said in the beginning, we can't succeed at anything. It's impossible. It's just the way the world is. You will achieve what you're enthusiastic about. Isn't it? So sometimes we even pray for enthusiasm. Krishna, give me enthusiasm. I don't like doing this, but I need to give me enthusiasm, pray. And that also works. Um, I've had so many experiences where I did not have the mentality that I needed to do the service I needed to do. And I was praying to Krishna, please give me the mentality. I need, this is the wrong mentality, this doesn't work. And at a certain point of praying, it was like I just took a drug and everything changed. Like, I'm not thinking the same way anymore. Like, what happened? Five minutes ago, thinking this way, now I'm thinking this way. And I realized the prayer was answered. So sometimes, if we're just enthusiastic about trying to be enthusiastic, we're not enthusiastic, we're enthusiastic about trying to be enthusiastic, praying, I need that enthusiasm. Krishna can change and then you can be the person you want to be. So that's what I wanted to say about enthusiasm. I don't know if that enthused you at all. But oh. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna. So now we can take some questions or comments. Yes? So Now you're getting into a different, ca different category of activity. Um, well, even if you feel like rolling on the ground, you shouldn't. That's the injunction of Shastra. And if you do, we are instructed to, to torture you. You know the story. You know, you know the story about the man who was rolling on the ground in the temple? You don't know that story? 
He came in the temple and he bowed down. Oh, he's rolling on the ground. These are all new devotees, very beginning of the movement. They never, never seen anything like it. Like, what's going on here? Right. This kind of manifestation is extremely rare. It's it's only, uh, it's, it's practically never seen someone on this level of ecstasy that is fainting and screaming and crying. It's a very high level of love of God. <laughs> so they said, Prabhupada, what should we do? He said, kick him in the head. <laughs> he, said, he said, if he's in ecstasy, he won't feel it. And if he's not, he'll know that we know that he's bogus. So these kinds of things, uh, we don't manifest externally, so you can't practice it. And um, now, there were a couple times when Srila Prabhupada manifested ecstasy, not rolling on the ground, but just losing external consciousness like that. And there's one story where I was actually there, and I, it was, he was either giving class or leading kirtan, and he stopped. And there was, it was a Mayapur, so there must have been five, six hundred of us. So you can imagine you're with Prabhupada, and he just, he's talking or chanting, and he stops and he's crying. Like, well, what do you do? Yeah. And it's one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, everyone's like. <laughs> so one devotee just spontaneously started kirtan, and then gradually Prabhupada came out. And, and then he's, I think he was giving class. He said, okay, like class is over. And so later, the devotee wanted to ask Prabhupada, what should, was that okay? Or what should we do when that happens? And as soon as he asked, Prabhupada said, I'm sorry, I don't do that often. He was apologizing because the injunction is that we should not manifest those symptoms because they'll be imitated cheaply. Do you know that there are people in India who are married and their job is begging? So they put on the clothes of the sannyasi, a renunciate. They put chilies in their nose. Do you know this? Chilies in their nose because it makes them cry or tear. And they sit down, just tears coming out everywhere. Bowl and innocent people will say, oh, Sadhu, in ecstasy, give him something. Did you know that? I was in, um, where was I? Bhubaneshwar. I was in Bhubaneshwar maybe like nine years ago, visiting some devotees. And he told me recently the government cracked down on gurus in Arissa, bogus gurus, because there apparently were many bogus gurus. And he said, all the big gurus are gone. They all left Arissa before the police could catch them because they're all bogus. So, you know, manifesting all kinds of symptoms of spiritual advancement to attract people, it's not our position. So, no rolling on the ground is allowed. Anyone who rolls on the ground, will, we, we will pick you up and talk to you. <laughs> yes? So thank you uh, very much for your So if you could um, explain a little bit more about the difference. Um, so there's a uh, purport in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita on Lila chapter 19. It's, it's like 158, 9 and 160 or something. It says, Hukinati, or diplomatic behavior, cannot satisfy the atma of the soul. It cannot even satisfy the body or the mind. The culprit mind is always suspicious, therefore our dealing should always be straightforward and approved by Vedic authorities. If we treat people diplomatically or duplicitously, our spiritual advancement is obstructed. So you had said at the beginning that, you know, how people could twist this and say, oh, I don't want to say that I'm, I want to be real. So obviously, there's that's not what we mean. But could, uh, could you just explain no, a little bit more? Yeah. What, what is it? It's a it's a good it's a good topic. We are so we are conditioned souls. Mm -hmm. So being real for us, we have to be careful. 
because we could, in the name of being real, give in to our weakness. You know, and we, we don't want to give in to our weakness. There's a story where devotees were telling Prabhupada, you have a disciple who's trying to follow the principles, he's very sincere, but he's very weak and he's continually falling down. And Prabhupada immediately responded, why are you giving in to weakness? Like, why are you allowing this to happen? You know, so in the name of being real, we could say, I'm weak and I'm just being honest about it. Which, of course, is good to be honest. But Prabhupada's point for this devotee was, well, you made a vow, so now that you made the vow, you can't give in to weakness. It's like, you know, you're married and say, it doesn't feel right, you know, I lost the spark. So I think I'm leaving. I'm just being real. You know, that's not the kind of reality we want to live. We want to be real about our vows and commitments, and we want to be real about our dedication. What Prabhupada is referring to here is the duplicity of pretension, lack of integrity, so that I'm pretending to be advanced when in fact at home I'm not. I'm, so I'm duplicitous, I'm showing my face to the public as something different, better, greater than I am. And, but actually, in my private life, I'm something much different. So, Sharalata, Sharalata is uh, the word which means, it's a Bengali word, as far as I understand, which means simplicity. So, simplicity as opposed to duplicity. Duplicity basically means two-faced. You say one thing, you mean another. Sharalata means simplicity, which we, in English, we think of simplicity, we think of a simpleton. Right, he's a guy so simple you, you can cheat him. But that's not what Prabhupada means by simplicity. He just contrasts duplicity. Simple, what you see is what you get. This person is honest, he's real. So it was never, that, that purport and that discussion was never intended to justify being uh, sinful or breaking principles. But still we have to address the principle of honesty because what if I am doing that? So the principle of honesty is that I have to honestly admit that I'm not what I should be. And that's the healing process. So duplicity is bad for the people you're around and it's bad for you because you're trying to fake everybody. And you, sometimes you even fake yourself out. You even believe you're not doing what you're doing because you become so convinced of your alter ego, of this sadhu, ego, that can happen. And you don't even notice the other side. So, you know, Prabhupada was really upset when people would take vows and they didn't follow them. It really bothered him. Because of this lack of, because of the duplicity of it. And he would say, he was, he was not bothered by the fact that people couldn't follow the principles. He was bothered by the fact that they he promised to do it. If they didn't promise and didn't follow, it didn't bother him. He would he would want them to follow for their benefit. It didn't personally bother him. But why? And he would say, "Why did you take the vow if you're not going to follow it?" That kind of thing. That kind of duplicity. So, um, one of the one of the problems of being a conditioned soul is that we have this need to be appreciated and honored by people. And that often becomes the cause of this kind of duplicity. Because I don't want to be real with you because I think if I'm real with you, you'll disrespect me or dislike me. You won't be my friend. Or I'm an older devotee. People need to respect me. If they don't, then they won't listen to me and I want to help them. So sometimes we think we have to pretend to the public for these two reasons, to either get the respect that I want or get the respect that I think I need so I can be a teacher. And I want to tell you a story. You had a question coming up. Yeah. Oh, somebody did, yeah. I want to tell you a story. This is amazing. You're probably you're never going to forget this story your whole life. You might even remember it in your next life if you, <laughs> if you do come back. This is an amazing story about honesty about the power of honesty. So I had a godbrother 
who was very highly placed in ISKCON, a respected leader. And about two years before, two or three years before he left his body, he revealed that he had a very serious problem for men, many, many, many years that he never told anybody. And so I was with some other uh, senior devotees. Some were on the phone with him, some were there, and we, we were discussing how to handle this situation. And we said, what do you want to do? And he said, well, I don't want to die with a secret. I want to tell everybody. And we said, well, you know, you have disciples. and Let's talk about it, you know, because we want to do this in a way that it doesn't cause people to lose faith. He said, Let, let's talk about how to do this. And so we went home that night, and we came back the next morning, and he said, I already posted it on the internet what I did. It's like, okay. So I thought, okay, I, I don't know. I wanted to feel the response of the public because I also wanted to help his disciples and I wanted to see their response. So I thought, let me go to the sites on the internet which are very critical of leaders who have problems. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. It has another name, starts with an R, but that's basically what it is. So I went to that site, this site, the site that if you, um, you know, eat, uh, eat a little too much, you'll be on their site for, over, <laughs> for overeating, you know. Like, it's like that, you know, nitpicking, you know, if you're, if you're unfortunate enough to be someone who's on their radar. I was featured in one of their magazines last year. Yeah. I'm famous now. So, um, so I went to their site, and they said, oh, so another leader has ha is having trouble. You know, that's their kind of, you know, that's their point. Leaders are having trouble. They're not really qualified. They shouldn't be leaders. And then they said, but at least he was honest. That was the first time they ever said anything good. Seriously, I'm not making this up. That was the only time that I, and I've, I've gone through their magazines. They're kind of, I mean, I don't go through them anymore, but I used to get them mailed to my house, so I'd go through their magazines a little bit just to see what they're saying. You know, sometimes they made points that were valuable. They were true. It's just not presented in a very proper way according to etiquette, but anyway, they never said anything good about anybody, and the person who had the biggest problem, because he was honest, they said, at least he was honest, that was the only person they glorified. And I said, wow. Wow. Honesty. People respect honesty. If, you, if I could sit in front of you and say, I made this mistake, you actually are not going to condemn me. You're going to think, wow, he's brave. He's honest. He's humble. That's how people will say it. People, devotees, non-devotees, all over the world think, if people knew what I was like, they wouldn't like me. It's completely the opposite. If you're vulnerable and humble enough to share what you're like, people like you more. They don't like people. Who likes proud people who won't admit their faults? Nobody does. And we're thinking, well, if you don't know what I'm like, you'll like me. I'll just come in and smile here. He's got a nice <laughs> smile, you know. I like that guy. He tells good jokes. I like that guy. Don't tell them what I'm really like at home because then they won't like me. No, it's the opposite. So, so, so with these and other experiences, I would say that to me, vulnerability is just the synonym to humility. And it's not that we're trying to hide. And so then I was, I was thinking about this because I'm developing a course. Well, it's kind of already developed, but I'm finalizing a course. And it talks about some of these things. And I started thinking. I said, you know, Prabhupada was quite vulnerable, but we don't really notice it so much because we don't use that word and frame it. If you listen to Prabhupada speaking, he'll tell you about things he did when he was a Grihasta, which, which are kind of like just ordinary. Oh, and of course, because he's our guru, we don't think. You know, when I was at the movies with my 
son. Are you going to the movies? I thought we're not supposed to go to movies. We don't think, but we don't realize it. He's being totally vulnerable. He's just saying, well, this is what I did. You know, my Guru Maharaj came to me in a dream, and he said, you should take sannyas. I was horrified. I have to give up my family. And Prabhupada's preaching this family attachment, you know. You, you, you need to reduce your attachment to, to material things and attachment to Krishna. And Prabhupada's saying, I'm horrified leaving my family. Completely open, vulnerable. And he's, he's the guru of the world. And, and he was never afraid to do those things. He, he told his ex-son, not his ex-son, he, <laughs> he told kind of like ex-son because he had like 5,000 other sons. So he told his son, when his son went to meet him, he said, you know, your mother was a very good wife and a very good mother. He said, I was a very bad husband. She was very, like he, he would admit these things. Just free, like completely free and open to admit it. Which shows us that vulnerability is humility. And Vaishnavas are not afraid to be vulnerable. But in this culture, it's different. And so we're all, you know, like hiding and, show, and trying to show off. So that's part of what Prabhupada means, not being vulnerable. So it's, it's good to be real because we have to be real to improve. If I have a problem, I need to talk about it with those who I can trust. And um, if I've made a mistake, it's good to be public about it. I made this mistake, I want to ask for forgiveness. It's, these things are necessary. So that's the kind of thing Prabhupada's meaning. But he's also meaning if, you, if you're committed to this path, then be committed 360, 24, 7. Otherwise, duplicitous. That's my understanding. Is that... Thank you for that question. That was a good one. Yes. Or but did you have or no? Yeah. Oh. Thank you so much for that amazing lecture. Uh, so I was uh, thinking about the point that you made about forgiveness. Yes. So there could be three questions that I was thinking about. First could be, uh, so in the first case you were saying that uh, a person was asked to uh, think positive about the other person in order to forgive that person. But sometimes we all, all already know the positives about the other person. But just because of some small thing, we would we would make that thing so big in our mind that we won't won't want to see the other things. Yes. That is the first point. So we won't be able to forgive the other person. Second uh, question would be forgiving our own self, even if we might be doing some, we might have done some small thing and then we might made it very big in our own mind and then we might not be able to forgive ourselves. And then third could be uh, others forgiving us. Let's say we did some mistake and then we are uh, requesting the other person to forgive us and he might not be forgiving us. So in the three cases, how could we deal? What, what should be our consciousness, basically? In the, f in the first case, you're saying you appreciate the person, but The bad that they did is is taking over. Yeah. I can put a plug in for my forgiveness books. You take my forgiveness books, it's online. Um, except we're changing from a website to an app. I don't know if that's there. But anyway, if you go to Mahatma.com, it, it'll direct you once it's on the app. Um, I would say the same thing I said before. I would force myself to see the good. Like, like, like for example, when you're married and, and you go into counseling, sometimes they'll say, tell me what you like about your wife. And like, uh, <laughs> you know, you're so angry, you can't see anything you like. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, So, no, no, tell me something good. You know. uh, she makes good baked potatoes. <laughs> you start with something like really peripheral. You know. uh, she, you know, uh, she chooses good colors for nail polish. You know, <laughs> you, you, you know it's like you can't, you can't say anything good because you're angry. So gradually, you say, you know, say something more about her, not about her nail polish or, <laughs> or potatoes or something. What qualities does she have? So as you do it, changes your focus, right? changes your heart. So 
so that's the same point. Sometimes you have to fo force yourself to do what's right because it will change your perception. You know? Like maybe at work, there's somebody you know who's like the supreme jerk at the office, right? There's probably always one or two in every office, right? Isn't there? I never worked in an office, but I imagine. You know? In many, many companies, there must be like, and the person's driving you crazy. And they're driving you crazy because all you see are the things you don't like. And I say to you, find something you like about that person that can turn around how you feel about them. So we're forcing you, sometimes you're forcing yourself to do something to better yourself. Forcing, the, forcing yourself to have a vision you would have if you were on a higher level. Right? And then we can say the same thing about self-forgiveness. So you were saying, I do a little thing and I blow it up and it's a big thing. All right, well, why don't you do the same thing? What do you like about yourself? What's good about yourself? You know, you start restructuring your self-image. Um, do people make mistakes? I mean, I could ask you 10 questions to help you. Do people make mistakes? Yes. Do good people make mistakes? Yes. Do nice people make mistakes? Yes. Do people with good motives sometimes make mistakes? Yes, you go down the list. Um, is to make mistakes you, human? Yes. Have you made a mistake? Yeah. Are you a good person? Then you want to say no, but now you can't because you just said good people make mistakes. Are you human? Yes. Is it it's okay to be human? Is it okay to be human? Is that all right? Is it? And so as you, you re, you're reframing your vision of yourself, and, you know, is it, is, and then you finally say, well, I guess it's not only okay to forgive myself, it's actually important because if I don't, my life is just going to go nowhere. Because you can't, you cannot progress hating yourself. You just can't. Sometimes we think hating ourselves is actually a solution to, to compensate for doing something bad. But hating yourself is never a solution. Feeling guilty and doing better, okay. But shaming yourself, destroying yourself, is never a solution. It's always a problem. Always, 100%. So we, we mix that, sometimes we mix that up. And we think, well, well I, I shouldn't forgive myself because if I did, that would be bad because I did something bad. Mm. No, it's, it's, yeah, well, if you do that bad every day and you forgive yourself every day, that's different. <laughs> but if you just did it once and you forgive yourself, it's like, I'm a human being. I did it when I was 17. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, like I'm smarter now. I'll never do that again. But still, I can't forgive myself. You know, it's like, you're going to go nowhere. You can't move forward with that mentality. And the last point but was? forgiving us. Like if we ask forgiveness and then oh, we expect oh, oh, Yeah, yeah, okay. So I offended you. I asked forgiveness and you say, no way, <laughs> never. You're never getting it. What do you do? You cannot depend if you, anything you want to do to work on yourself, and in this, in this case, you want to, you want to do your best. So you ask forgiveness, you regret what you did, you lament about it, you've changed your life, you've remedied, you've done everything. And this one person is saying, no way, I'll never forgive you. It ha you have to relegate it to their problem. It can no longer be your problem because you've done everything. So if they're not happy with you, it's their issue. I don't want to, you know, we don't want to psychoanalyze them, but forgiveness, resentment is always your issue. It's nothing about the person. Just take it from me after 20 years of teaching it. In, the, in about three quarters of the way through our workshop, we get rid of the person and we just focus on us and why we responded to that event with resentment. It had nothing to do with what they did. Because a hundred people were affected by that person. Out of the hundred, three are resentful and the others don't care what they did. So it can't be what they did. It has to be us and the way we see it and respond to it. Right? So their re that's their choice to respond that way. What can you do? You know, wish them well and you know, you've done everything. You know, a lot of times we regret, we lament, we feel guilty, we beat ourselves up 
after we've done everything possible we can to remedy a situation, you can't do anything more. Why would you want to beat yourself up after you've done everything possible that you can? You've done your best. And so sometimes we do our best. My best isn't good enough. Oh, the perfectionist, right? Mm -hmm. I have news for the perfectionist. There's a verse in Bhagavad Gita that every endeavor is covered by some sort of fault. I don't know if you perfectionists have read that verse, but if you haven't, I think you should get a tattoo with that verse. <laughs> right here, and just like look at it. Like, maybe right here, every time you uh, look in the mirror. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times people will, will have done everything possible to remedy a situation and they still won't forgive themselves. It will still be done on themselves. It makes no sense. You can't, oh, I'm so bad, I'm so this. Yeah, but look what you did. You, you did everything you can. And you were like only 17 when you did it, you know. You know, gentlemen, I hate to say this, but you don't really have a brain that works till you're about 28, according, <laughs> according to science. Yeah, Ridai Nanari said, you know, most of the early sannyasis took sannyas before their brains actually functioned. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're under 28, you can look forward to your 28th birthday when your brain starts to actually work, you know. Um, so when we're young, we do all kinds of stupid things, isn't it? And to live with that regret your whole life, after you've made amends, apologized, you know, worked on yourself, healed your problems. It doesn't make any sense. It will destroy you completely. Self-forgiveness is essential to move forward. Self-acceptance. Okay, how would you like to be? I like to be like this. How are you? I'm like this. Is anything going to change today? I can't accept how I am. This is how I am. Is anything going to change today? You have your whole life to get up here, but today you're here. So what's the point of not accepting yourself today? doesn't make any sense because this is how you are. You can still get up here, but we're all regretting that we're not up here. Oh, I'm so bad. I'm down here. I'm like the worst person in the universe. How could I be down here? You've had millions of lifetimes to get you down here. You know, you're conditioned. All these some scars, you know, it's like, you know, Ever see someone try to sing who can't sing? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. it's like I was thinking of going American Idol. No, not this lifetime. <laughs> you know, maybe you should be an accountant or a scientist and, or something. You know, that you're good at. So it's fine if you can't sing. You know, you can do something else. You know, you can paint, you can write, you can cook. It's like I'm a good cook, but I can't do this. It doesn't matter. It's not. Krishna gave you certain talents. So instead of being happy with what we have, we look at this, what we want to be, and we're not, and we're like, I'm so depressed, why? Do you know the wealthiest people are usually the most depressed? Because they live in wealthy neighborhoods, and their neighbors have, have so many things that they're looking at that they don't have, so they're like depressed, right? I once heard this teacher who said something, you know, for all us depressed people who wish we had more, he said, there are billions of people in the world right now who wish they had as much as you have. Isn't that an interesting way of looking at it? So, if you want to lament about something and about yourself, you don't need a reason to. You can just do it, right? Just like you want to find fault with someone, you don't need a fault, you'll find one. You'll make one up, right? So if you want to do that with yourself, you'll make up all kinds of faults about yourself and be miserable, but why? If we want to be Krishna conscious, or want to be anything. It's the worst thing you can do. Absolutely. The worst thing. Yeah, but I'm so bad. I have to hate myself. You know. That's all conditioning. That's all what your mother told you when you didn't get straight A's, right? <laughs> What's this, you know, A minus you got, you know? Useless. I don't want to see you, you know? Then, then we start feeling like that. That's your mother's problem. <laughs> don't make it your problem. No offense to mothers. But sometimes mothers do that in, with the best interest in mind. You, know? right? you ever see those like, funny YouTube videos with the Indian families? You know, like, our son didn't get into Harvard and this and that. You know? It's like, I'm so depressed. And then, then you see the son, he's six years old. You know? it's like, <laughs> you know, he's only six years old. You know, give him a break. You know? he's, he's not doing this, he's not doing that. He's, you know. So um, 
mothers and fathers, you have to be really careful because your intentions are to inspire. I know so many young people whose parents try to inspire them and they have low self-esteem because they interpret it as I'm not good enough. You can do better, you're smart. Like they interpret it as I'm not good enough. You have to be really careful. Right? And then they grow up being really good, but they think they're not good enough and they hate themselves. Like, why would you hate yourself? You're so successful, yeah, but I'm not this. So we have all this carrot dangling in front of us, which is destroying us when you're fine down here. It's like, you're okay and you can move up over time, right? Don't you all wish you were like pure, 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 elevated, you know, like no desire for anything other than just accept the suffering of all the world's karma on your shoulders joyfully and save the world. That would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, anybody like that in this room? Anybody plan to be like that this week? <laughs> Probably not. We're kind of here. But being here is still okay because there's so much good being down here, right? Isn't it? We have, all have so many good qualities. Yes? Next question is, how do you generate enthusiasm in, in your fellow devotees or your children or you know, your, your family members? Oh, yes. Good question. I don't know if you know, all know this, but when we would do some little thing and report it to Prabhupada, he'd always say, I'm very happy with what you're doing. Please continue. This is a very encouraging. I can see... Krishna is guiding you, he's giving you intelligence, you're all intelligent young American boys and girls, Krishna is certainly helping you. He did all these things. And if you ask disciples of Prabhupada, say, how were you able to achieve so much? He said, well, we always had this person behind us thing. you can do it, you can do it. You're, I'm happy with what you're doing, continue this way. Krishna will help you. So. One time, Vaisheshika Prabhu and I were talking, and he said, he called me up to talk about it. I think, I think he, he wanted to talk, we wanted to talk in general. He said, you know, about what, what is your, like, essence about being a guru? And I said, to encourage people. I said, that's basically what I do. I just encourage people. Because there's a lot of discouragement about what we just spoke about. You know, you look in the mirror and you go, oh, my God, this is so depressing, you know. And so Prabhupada didn't let us do that. He would always say, no, you're great, you're wonderful. And I said, Vaisheshika Prabhu, what do you think? He said, exactly, that's, that's how I see myself, as an encourager. And that's our service, to encourage. Because that was Prabhupada's service. So um, the problem is when you encourage, when the kid is encouraged this way, and you kind of discourage this way because you want to encourage this way, and now you encourage them into a state of like, discouragement, because they don't want to be that. So you have to be careful. Um, I know from being a parent, you don't want to, I even know this from being a husband, you don't want to encourage someone in something they're not encouraged to do, because it upsets them. Yeah. Thank you for your encouragement, but it's not what I want to do. It's a polite way of saying, could you shut up? <laughs> So I've heard that said in the polite way many times. So I've learned my lesson. That be careful about encouraging someone to do something that's not encouraging to their nature. So when I was a little kid, they had these mono reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. Mono means one track, not stereo. They didn't have like computers or multi-track recorders. And if you wanted to do that, even the Beatles only had four tracks. So I, I used to sit with this multi-track and I had a guitar and I used to like write my songs when I was 13, 14, I write my songs and I record them, you know? And I started, I, I was teaching a course on finding your dharma, you know, like what, what is, you know? So sometimes people say, what's my dharma? I go, ask your mother. Say, mother, what did I used to do 
when I was young. They go, well, you should sit with this tape recorder and you'd write songs and sing them. You know, maybe something about communication, like you have a message to the world or something like that. But the problem was my parents didn't notice that. Like, you know, like, what's your son doing? You know, he's sitting with his tape recorder writing songs. Hmm, maybe that means something. Maybe, you know, we want to, like, you know, give him a songwriting class or a voice lessons, or maybe he wants guitar, le guitar lessons. I just play guitar, I never took lessons. So I, I was, after I gave this course, I was thinking, why don't my parents notice that? You know, it would have been, you know, I would have been, I could have had a skill that I could have cultivated a skill that I didn't cultivate. Why didn't they notice that? They didn't notice it because they wanted me to go that way. And that way was not what was in their mind. You know, like, what are you going to, how are you going to make a living sitting in front of a tape recorder with a guitar? So, you know, you don't have to make a living doing it, but it's something you like to do. And so you see what your children like to do. Maybe they're not going to make a living with it, but they can do it in service, you know. A lot of young girls, they love to dance. I mean, okay, so, you know, you notice that. All right, you want to learn. You can dance Krishna Leela. Why not? Is that okay? Yeah. I forgive my parents. I wanted to be a rock star, Prabhupada said. You'll, ne you'll never be a rock star. He said, don't, he said, don't worry, it'll never happen. I was like, oh, he saved me. It probably wouldn't have never happened anyway, but... If he, if he, uh, you know, I, I wrote a letter to Prabhupada saying, well, you know, we should start a rock band. You know, we'll fill up the stadiums, everyone will get a Krishna book, you know, 10,000 Krishna books, 20,000 in one, one evening, you know, let's do it. Prabhupada's like, yeah, right. <laughs> dream on. This is basically, in, in my paraphrase, dream on. And, and I always tell devotees, you know, it's like, you know, I'll put, it, I'll put some music on YouTube, you know, I'll get like three views or something. It's like Prabhupada's curse. You know? No, <laughs> some, some, sometimes I get more. You know? I mean, I actually, have a mi I actually have a million. I guess the curse was taken away, you know. But I think like, you know, it's, it's it's never going to happen. It's like, but, but that's good. So I think, I think, you know, when I wrote that letter, I was 19. I said, could you imagine, you know, if I started a band and we actually made it, and I'm like 19 or 20, and we made it? Forget it. I'd be finished, you know, because it's all sex and drugs. You know, like, how would I survive that? So Prabhupada's blessing, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Dai Go Premanandi. So you're all invited tonight. We're doing a course on Java tonight, right? Yes. Seven o'clock? No, five o'clock. Five o'clock. Oh, five o'clock. We, we already communicated through the email, WhatsApp, and also the notice board is also there. So we will announce it in the announcements also.